The first thing that comes to mind about that statement is just how panicked the bourgeois are that they feel they have to defend their own system, a system that they said won out after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But it also tells us something else, that it's interesting when a representative of the ruling class actually talks about their own system, its historical role, and its origin. And one thing that I found, and, and perhaps you found the same, if you ever had the opportunity to look into what bourgeois historians and what kind of bourgeois politicians say and theoreticians say about capitalism, how it evolved and its role in society, it's, um, it's particularly interesting. And the emphasis they always put is on freedom and liberty, free trade, free enterprise, free markets. Um, the famous uh, neoliberal thinker, if you can call him that, Milton Friedman, wrote a book called free Capitalism and Freedom, making the link that economic freedom, and for him economic freedom means the freedom to, well, to exploit the labor of, labor of others, but what he would say is to ply a trade in a free way without interference from the state is linked to political freedom and liberty in general. However, when it actually comes to the question of what capitalism actually is, often the bourgeois themselves can't really explain it. To take one example, an exa example I always use of kind of popular history and the popularization of kind of the, the liberal bourgeois view of history. There's a book called uh, Sapiens by uh, Yuval Noah Harari in which the story of how capitalism came to being is more or less that a, f a fellow called Adam Smith in 1776 had the idea that if you take the money you have and employ other people to work for you and, and then invest the money you make off that into more means of production, then that would be a good thing. And the world went, why didn't we think of that earlier? <laughs> and this great liberating idea increased the size of the pie, the global pie of wealth, meaning that even those who had been exploited also were better off. And that the entire world was lifted out of the kind of uh, the, the impoverishment, the dirt poverty of the last several thousand years and ushered in this new era of ever rising prosperity. And that's a very common idea that's linked to the origin of capitalism that really when the, history, the real history of capitalism is rarely talked about. What's usually talked about is enterprising merchants who had this great idea of buying low and selling high, making money, making more money, employing other people, giving them money, and everybody gets rich off it. And the, the main thing that I want to consider is, first of all, what exactly is capital? How did it come, has it always been um, present in society? And if not, how did it come into being? Um, and the various different aspects of this, uh, this development. So, as you can probably tell, I don't think capital, capital has always been present. Merchants have always been present in civilization. You can see the evidence of merchants as far ago, uh, ago as 5,000 years. Money has been present for m much, if not all, of the existence of, uh, of civilization, sorry, in one way or another. And yet capital certainly hasn't. And for Marx, capital was certainly a lot more than just money, or even means of production, or even actually the workers, or even the capitalist him or herself. Capital, for Marx, was a relation, an interaction between two polar opposites, really. One being the concentration of the means of production as private wealth, epitomizes money, but not exclusively uh, contained by money. And on the other hand, free labor. So free capital, in other words, money, property, capable of accumulating, buying up whatever means of production it needs, including human labor, labor power, sorry, to be precise, um, that being uh, someone's ability to work. So they're not, but their, their person isn't bought like a chattel slave, their ability to work is bought. And then on the other hand, free laborers. And the interesting aspect of this particular freedom, which is maybe the most striking freedom of capitalism, is it's, it's very much of a double nature, two-sided nature. On the one hand, they're free in the sense that they're no longer tied or part of the means of production. So a chattel slave was considered, in ancient society and in, in kind of more modern slavery, considered actually part of the means of production, more like a, a work animal or a machine, an instrument with a voice the Romans called slaves. A serf was someone who was forcibly tied to the land. They didn't sell their labour, they gave their labour under force of arms, really, under feudalism. However, the modern worker is nominally and legally free to go where they like, well, with certain restrictions, obviously, to sell their labour power to whoever they like. And maybe in your, depending on what, you uh, what you're doing at uni, if you are at uni, one thing I saw doing a law degree is often the lecturers would say, no, no, wage slavery makes no sense because you can choose your boss. If you don't like it, you can go elsewhere and just choose another boss to sell your labour power to. That is a form of freedom. But also, and this is arguably the most important form of freedom under capitalism, 
Marx used the expression free as a bird to describe the propertyless, propertyless proletarian. Somebody who is not only free from slavery in a formal sense, but is free of any sort of property and means of reproducing himself, herself, and their family at all. Someone who is free from ownership of the means of production, means of subsistence, and so is somebody who is so atomized and so alienated from the means of production and from objective wealth that they have to sell themselves effectively piecemeal in order to get hold of any of the necessities of life. And the history of capitalism is essentially the history of the production of those two elements. The production on the one hand of free capital capable of accumulating and buying up whatever it likes and the free worker. And what Marx says about that is that it required the, um, the, the historical process of divorcing the actual producers, working the land for example, from their own means of production. And Marx says this history, the history of their expropriation, is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. And so much of this introduction is basically going to be talking about that history. One other idea that um, comes to mind when we talk about the, the kind of the liberation of the worker by capitalism is an expression from, uh, by Hegel, actually, which says that it's not so much from slavery but through slavery that mankind is freed. And in this sense, uh, in, the, in the case of the origin of capitalism, I think that this is um, doubly striking because what we see in the history of capitalism, which I'm about to kind of run through, admittedly in quite a, a potted way, but hopefully we can get some of the main points across, is that the early stages, the prehistory of capitalism, cannot be divorced from the struggle of the serfs and the peasantry living under um, uh, feudalism for their own liberation. But at the same time, through that struggle for liberation, followed, uh, following, sorry, from that struggle for liberation, and through the liberation, if you like, of capital to do as it likes, came probably the biggest and most traumatic wave of robbery, exploitation, and enslavement in every sense of the word that there probably has been ever in the whole history of humanity. That's what Theresa May refers to, by the way, by the greatest agent of collective human progress. And so I will leap straight into this because I have limited time. One disclaimer is, obviously, with only 40 minutes, it's not possible to go into every single aspect of the development of capitalism. Hopefully, we can draw that out in the discussion. I'm going to concentrate largely on processes that were going on in England from about kind of the 13th century onwards, so it's still quite a, a wide scope of, uh, of discussion. Um, that's not to say that capitalism didn't develop anywhere else. Obviously, we wouldn't be living in a world capitalist system if it was just confined to England. The reason why I concentrate on England, as Marx did, is first of all that it is really the first fully-fledged capitalist society, and so it offers us much material for investigation. But also, what's fascinating about England is this process was drawn out over centuries Whereas if you look at the, the, the bourgeois revolution in France, for example, the great French revolution, many of the kind of the stages, if you like, in the evolution of the bourgeoisie and of capitalism in France took place almost all at once. The religious reformation, the agra agrarian revolution, I'm going to talk about all these things if you're, if you're confused as to what I mean. The kind of political seizure of power by the bourgeoisie really took place in the space of a single generation. In England, that's not the case. And in England, we can separate all these different processes and analyze them one by one and in their connection with each other. However, I won't be concentrating solely on England because, of course, to talk about the origin of capitalism within the bounds of a single country is absurd. And the, the origin and development development of the world market, which of course played an important role in the uh, transatlantic slave trade, is also something that I'll try to uh, consider as much as I can. So going straight into it, I mentioned about the struggle between the serfs and the lords, and this, this, is re this really ep epitomizes the class struggle under feudalism. In reality, it's the lord-serf relationship and the exploitation of serfs which forms the backbone of feudalism, and it was really the rise and the fall of, fall of that form of exploitation which determines the fate of feudalism, particularly in England. And so what do I mean by serfdom? I should probably explain that. So a serf was someone who had a small plot of land in the manorial state, attached to often quite large common tracts of, of pasture and common land that he could use in common with other villagers, but in order to have any of that and in order to be able to be live in society, he was forced by the lord, of the, the lord of the Land to provide free labour. So there was two forms of free labour. One was the usual weekly free labour, where about three to four days of the week he would go and work on someone else's land for nothing. One cute thing about the way that bourgeois philosophers, uh, historians look at the past is they look back at that and say, the serf only had to work four days a week. 
what a life. But you, we might point out that it's four days a week for nothing, and for the rest of the week, the peasant and his family has to work on his own land in order to be able to eat. But the, the bourgeois looks back and sees a four-day week and thinks, what were they doing? Why weren't they working seven days a week? It shows actually the fundamental difference between those two systems. But e either way, on top of that, you also had boon work. And that came, across, that came about whenever the Lord needed it, basically. Maybe a new uh, mill needed building. Maybe harvest time came around and the Lord needed extra hands. So the peasant would have to, the serf would have to drop everything that was going on in his own life and go and help the Lord's lands. This was effectively a form of slavery. The word serf is actually French of the time for slave. It means exactly the same thing. And really it was slavery attached to the land and attached to the Lord. Even Pope Innocent III, who if I remember correctly was kicking about in the 13th century, described it as, oh, extreme condition of bondage. So when even the Pope is taking notice of it, it must have been pretty awful. And, but this is not, sometimes I think people make a mistake when they talk about feudalism. They think it's a completely static state of affairs where basically nothing changed and then little pockets of urban merchants somehow managed to overthrow it almost from outside. It wasn't quite like that. There was an internal, a very powerful inter internal dynamic within feudalism and that was the driving force behind its dissolution actually. And that was the conflict, as we would probably expect as Marxists, between the exploiter and the exploited. And that conflict did not take the same uh, form as the conflict between workers and bosses, probably for obvious reasons. They were working in completely different conditions, arguably opposite conditions really. But it had a very important effect on society, not just in England, but I'm going to concentrate on England. So one way in which serfs uh, rebelled against their lords um, was by fleeing. And actually in many countries, in England, in, in Germany, well, what, what is now called Germany, um, a peasant was given the opportunity to free himself. If he managed to escape to one of the um, few towns, like London for example, and live there for a year and a day, he would be granted freedom. The, the Lord could no longer come and take him by force. Anything, if he's caught between that time, before that time, sorry, he could be physically taken and dragged back to the land to work, similar to a slave, an escaped slave. That obviously was quite an attractive proposition for many, um, many serfs, although it's not as easy as it sounds. And that process is accelerated by a number of factors. One is that uh, the, the Crusades actually had an effect on this, partly because in the case of England, Richard the Lionheart, Richard I, who, uh, who fancied himself as a bit of a crusader, he needed cash for all of these uh, excursions, all of these adventures. And one of the ways in which he made cash was he sold town charters to a lot of new flourishing towns, which meant not only that the royal coffers were filled, but there were more and more opportunities and more and more locations for freed serfs to escape and establish themselves. And these, these people were the first bourgeois. The, the origin of the bourgeoisie is in many cases escaped serfs from the countryside. But these towns were not kind of the manufacturing towns of the, you know, the, the 18th and 19th century. We're basically, we're really talking about glorified villages at this point. But through in, within these villages, you start to have a new form of organization, a more new form of social organization. The towns were organized almost like a kind of bourgeois trade union, if that's not a contradiction in terms, that they had certain obligations towards each other. They took the form of guilds eventually. And you had all sorts of guilds. You had merchants' guilds. You then had guilds for various craftsmen. You also had guilds for uh, journeymen who were the kind of lower level of the guild um, uh, artisans, effectively, who tended to be exploited by the masters. And actually, the one guild that tended to be cracked down on the most was the journeyman's guild, because they effectively saw it as a primordial trade union. Um, and so with the origin of this bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie doesn't suddenly announce itself as the bourgeois, sorry, the revolutionary class and start waging war on the feudal aristocracy. In reality, for pretty much the entirety of the life of feudalism, the real class struggle is going on between the peasants and the lords. Marx himself even says that actually the rise of the bourgeoisie, he says this in Capital Volume 1, the rise of the bourgeoisie was in essence the bourgeois taking advantage of victories won by other people, effectively on their behalf. And we can see this, even we can see this as early as Magna Carta. Magna Carta is not a bourgeois constitutional document. Magna Carta is a load of landowning barons, military nobles, dictating to the king how they want him to behave. The king at that time was primus inter partes, or pares, sorry, first among equals. Really, he was a lord himself that was invested with this special power, but it didn't stretch all that far. So they're telling him this is how things are going to be. But if you look into Magna Carta, there's one clause that doesn't really help the feudal aristocracy very much, and that's a tax exemption for merchants in the city of London. So first of all, from that we can see that there was the presence of merchants in the city of London, but also that their inter interests temporarily, in this case, coincided with the feudal aristocracy in limiting the powers of, kind of the arbitrary monarchy. Later on, in absolutism, which I'll come to, we see a bit of a reversal of that trend. But having to skip on a little bit, basically, by um, another um, incident 
that accelerates this process a great deal is the Black Death, actually. And one interesting and kind of contradictory aspect of the Black Death is, despite the fact it devastated more than a third of the European population, perhaps even more, and it hit England um, as hard as many other places, that actually accelerated the decline of feudalism rather than putting a stop on any further development. It shows that history is never static, actually. It's always moving in one direction or another. And accidental factors can often be really the expression of an underlying necessity, as, uh, as Hegel and Marxists have often said. One effect that it had was there was a shortage of labour, as you can probably imagine. And what that meant was that um, kind of temporary wage labourers, and again, these wage labourers are not workers in the modern sense. They often had their own lands, and what they do is in, in it was seasonal labour. You know, they work their own lands, and in their own free time, if you can call it that, they go and work on someone else's land for a wage. They, they were able to dictate very high wages. It also lessened the power of the lords, meaning that more serfs were able to escape into the towns. And so this, this had two effects, really, talking in general. One was that the, by, by really the end of the 14th century, serfdom no longer exists in England. That's not the case everywhere on earth. It's certainly not the case in, in places like France, for example. But in England, serfdom was dead by the end of the, uh, the, uh, the 14th century. Um, one other thing that kind of sounded the death knell of serfdom was the Peasants' Revolt, very famous Peasants' Revolt in 1381. And one of the key demands of that revolt was the end of serfdom. But in reality, what they were doing was they were landing the death blow to a, a form of exploitation that had already dwindled to a minority of the population. I might m mention that at the time of the Doomsday Book in the 1080s, the, the ser people who had categorized as serfs by Norman lawyers constituted about 75% of the English population. By, by the end of the 14th century, by the Peasants' Revolt, we're talking much, much less, really a small minority of the population. And one other interesting uh, factor in this, so we have the kind of the liberation of the peasantry won by their own struggle, as well as uh, other outside factors, by the end of the 14th century. But you also have the state cracking down increasingly on these um, free workers. Again, these are more like peasants who are doing wage work. But it's in this era that you have English kings passing laws um, setting the working day at a certain length of time, because they thought that the workers were too lazy. And they also have way, um, legislation fixing a maximum wage that's something interesting. It's kind of the antithesis of what we see today. That rather than having to set a minimum wage in an attempt to kind of mollify the class struggle and protect workers, we see a maximum wage being set because they thought that workers' bargaining power was too strong, basically, due to the shortage of labour. This is the kind of, when we think of uh, neoliberal philosophers talking about the need to avoid state intervention, they didn't take into account that enormous amounts of state intervention needed to even create cap capitalism in the first place. Although we're not quite talking about capitalism at this point, this is really the precursor to it. Later, in the, uh, the, f the 15th century, we have the Wars of the Roses, which um, are epoch-making in the sense that really it was the mutual exhaustion of the remaining kind of feudal aristocracy. They basically fought themselves to a standstill. And what arose, of course, was the beginnings of absolutism in England with Henry Tudor and the Tudor monarchy. Now, what's interesting about that is not just that it came off the back of really the, the defeat of the lords. They'd lost, if you like, their social basis. The power of the lords really came from the serfs, the labour of the serfs. Just as the modern bourgeois, just as the power of Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos sorry, comes from his exploitation of thousands upon thousands of workers. Once they left, lost that, and they were basically just taking rent, they, uh, and basically had a few bands of retainers, basically like a mafia organisation really, they extinguished themselves and exhausted themselves with a number of, uh, of fat fratricidal wars, with the Wars of the Roses being a great example of that and left the field open for effectively another wing of their own class to come to power. But what has the bourgeoisie got to do with this? It just so happens that Henry Tudor took a lot of money from the City of London in particular, and the goldsmiths of the City of London. In fact, he, he rarely called a parliament, Henry VII, and the main reason for that is he didn't need to call The main reason for calling a parliament in feudal times was to get money, to raise taxes, for example. He didn't feel the need to do that because he, he tended just to take loans from the City of London. What we effectively had was an alliance with the rising absolutist monarchy against the kind of remaining wing, the reactionary wing, if you like, of the feudal aristocracy. Um, and again, this shows the kind of intermediary role, if you like, of the bourgeoisie at this time. So by, the, by kind of the beginning of the Tudor period, what we have is the vast majority of the population are relatively free property-owning peasants, small land-owning peasants. You then have a bourgeoisie concentrated in the cities. Remember that the word bourgeois literally just means city dweller. Um, 
Uh, these were not made up of manu um, like you know top hat wearing factory owners. They were made up of merchants, artisans, lawyers, and then what remains really of the feudal uh, aristocracy. That on its own does not create capitalism. And one other development which spurred this on, and is going on parallel but also kind of interlinked with this development, is the origin of the world market, which I'll talk about now. Now, trade and the production and exchange of commodities is something that has been present to one extent or another throughout the history of civilization, as I mentioned earlier. What we see from the kind of the so-called like medieval boom onwards, and arguably even earlier really, is increased connections between the West, a kind of barbarian Europe, and the East, particularly with the unification of the, the ancient East, or what was the ancient East, by the Arab Empire, we start to see more interaction and commerce between these two kind of wings of the Mediterranean. That's where we see rises, the, the rise of things like Venice, for example, huge, important trading city in the Middle Ages. And through that, we also see the rise of the Hanseatic League, see these German city-states based, again, on trading, linking the Baltic with the Mediterranean, very important trade route. And this also has an effect on sleepy old England, that it raises demand for wool. Places like Ghent in Flanders were big wool manufacturing centres, and um, it just so happened that England had almost a monopoly, really, on wool, wool production. That's one of the reasons, incidentally, you might have known, I don't know if you know this, but in the English Parliament in the House of Commons, the Speaker sits on a sack of wool, on a pile of wool. That's kind of establishing the importance, really, of the wool trade to British capitalism from its earliest ever inklings, really. They understood where they came from. Um, and one effect that this had was, first of all, with, and if you go to the session on money and Bitcoin, you'll learn a bit more about this, with the increased um, need and the increased uh, preponderance of com commodity production and exchange, you have an increasing need for a means, a, a, a circulating medium, a medium of exchange, that is money, a universal commodity. So with that, the demand for money and precious, uh, um, sorry, pre precious, uh, what's the word, metals, increases. And also the general demand for products such as wool increase. Now one, effect, one way that the feudal lords, and again these are not capitalists, these are feudal lords, or what's left of them, one way that they defended themselves against the liberation of the peasants, because the ruling class is never just going to say, okay, fair's, you know, fair's, fair's fair, you beat me fair and square. One way that they managed to kind of get around this problem is by turfing peasants off their land, encroaching more and more onto common land, and turning what was arable land, in other words, growing wheat, for example, into pasture land for sheep to produce more wool to then sell in a raw form to the merchants in Ghent. And this started a process which would eventually kind of snowball into the kind of what Marx called the, the robbery of the people in the enclosures and the clearings. But I'm going to come on to that later. First, I want to talk a bit more about the world market. What we have by the 15th century is a very well established. Um, mini world market, if you like, concentrated around the Mediterranean, where many of the business practices that, co uh, that constitute capitalism today, things like double entry accounts, um, things like companies, joints, um, the beginnings, kind of the primordial form of joint stock companies have already been created in places like Italy, also like uh, places like Egypt, inter interestingly. Um, and obviously, you probably already know, in 1492, Columbus discovered America. Um, and before that, Vasco da Gama also um, set sail on his famous voyages. What is the context behind this? Because often it's, it's, it's put forward as basically an, a, a big accident, that really the growth of capitalist Europe was the result of one bloke who landed in Cuba, wasn't it, the first time, or Hispaniola, and th thought it was India. It wasn't, but it didn't matter because he became extremely wealthy anyway. And uh, America, uh, America, sorry, Europe suddenly rocketed up. There's an element of that because the wealth that was sucked out of the new world pr produced kind of, it gave the fuel to the flames of developing uh, I suppose what would become capitalism in Europe. But what's the context of this? Why did this happen? There's an element of ac accident here, but let's not forget that Columbus wasn't Spanish, he was Italian, and he went around the various courts of Europe asking someone to sponsor his journey. Tra traveling the Atlantic was extremely costly, pretty difficult, and so it required a rich person to basically give it backing. The Portuguese monarch, who I can't remember, became a footnote in history, I suppose, maybe they should have taken a different decision, decided it was too risky, not worth the outlay. Because, of course, if the ship goes down, then you're not going to get anything back. The Spanish monarch decided to have a punt on this, this chancer, effectively. And one of the reasons for this was that in the intervening centuries, the rising commodity production and exchange, and also the, the increasing penetration of the money economy 
into the European economy had in increased the amount of dependence, well, on various sections of society, but particularly the monarchy, on um, money lending and basically commodity, the commodity economy. The, the Spanish um, monarchy was already heavily in debt and saw this as an opportunity to really break the trade um, blockade represented by the Ottomans in the East before trade with the East was carried over land. So many European nations were desperate to find some kind of Western route to be able to break that. In other words, what they were expressing was the developing market, the developing market economy. The pressure of all of this basically social force was pushing them in the direction of the West. Columbus obviously lands, and I've got a, a, um, a charming description of how this isn't actually Columbus, but um, Pizarro's men, when they landed in Incalange, this is what, what one of the locals described them as. They said, he said, they lifted up the gold as if they were monkeys, with expressions of joy, as if it put new life into them and lit their hearts, as if it were certainly something for which they yearn with great thirst. Their bodies fatten on it, and they hunger violently for it. They crave gold like hungry swine. And what was the way in which they sought this gold and silver? First, um, on Hispaniola, going back to Columbus, he forced the local inhabitants, who were called Arawaks, to bring him a certain quantity of gold every three months. Those who failed to do so would have their hands chopped off or were hunted down and killed. From 1494 to 1508, a fellow called Bartolomé de las Casas, at the time, a witness to these events, he wrote, over three million people had perished from war, slavery, and the mines. Who in future generations will believe this? I myself writing it as a knowledgeable eyewitness can hardly believe it. It, it, it is unbelievable, and yet living in capitalism today, maybe not so unbelievable. Bearing in mind that bourgeois, when, when this is raised, when the crimes of the, the Spanish and, and others in America are raised, they often say, oh, well, that was before. That was kind of a feudal monarchy. That's not our fault. But at the beginning of the 20th century, the Belgian monarch, Leopold II, did exactly the same thing in the Congo. He chopped off people's hands. He executed people for not doing enough. But this time it wasn't gold. It was rubber. And what was the reason for that? It wasn't, you know, rubber isn't quite as kind of uh, glamorous as gold. It shows that it's not something specific to gold as a commodity that makes it so desirable. It was actually an ex ex expression of the value being produced in this market economy. In reality, these monkeys, these murderers, these uh, thieves were the personification of the power of this developing market. That's not absolving them of guilt, of course, but I think it offers an explanation as to the devastating effects of this world market as it... Um, as it spread, it, it reminds me of the, what the poet Virgil said, that no wickedness is beyond a man whom that accursed gold lust, gold lust drives. He wasn't to know that later on under Leopold II it would also constitute rubber lust, but it still has exactly the same effect socially. Um, and this, I want to bring in a quote from Marx here because uh, I think it epitomizes really the situation. He says, the dis it's a very famous one from Capital, the discovery of gold and silver in America, the extirpation, enslavement, and entombment in mines of the original Aboriginal population, the beginning of the conquest and looting of the East Indies, the turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins signalized the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist <coughs> production. These idyllic proceedings are the chief memento of primitive accumulation. It wasn't just in the Americas, it wasn't just in Africa, and I'll mention the trade, uh, transatlantic slave trade a bit later as well. The Dutch in the East Indies used exactly the same uh, means. In Indonesia, they hired people who were literally called man-stealers to get, well, you can probably gather what they were employed to do, and then they would sell those slaves on the market. Now, what's going on? Why, why did slaves, why did chattel slaves become such a sought-after commodity? What you, do, what you tend to do with a slave is put them to work, and at that time, the rising commodity economy and the money economy demanded increased production. We're seeing kind of the origins, really, of, of the kind of the capitalist economy coming into being, and it demanded constant production. However, at that time, there was no working class. And I'm going to come on to the creation of the working class, which is another uh, sordid tale. Um, it required a working class. It didn't exist. So what do you do in the meantime? You purchase commodified labor in another form, or you take it by force, of course. And this creates an insatiable demand for this human labor. That's why when the, when the um, Europeans first arrive on the coasts of, uh, of Western Africa and places like the, uh, the Kingdom of the Congo, they, they ha would have no chance whatsoever of conquering these kingdoms. In fact, they, they didn't even attempt it. What they started doing was they established trade 
post. Again, in India, the Portuguese that arrived in India did not conquer India. They did do some charming things like massacre the entire Muslim population of Goa because they didn't let them in in the first place. But in terms of conquering the entire subcontinent, it wasn't even on the agenda. They wouldn't have been able to do it. They weren't powerful enough. What they did do is establish trade posts, and then those trade posts, if you like, became an opening into this power of the world market. Again, it's almost, thinking about it dialectically, it's almost like the relationship between the part and the whole. It's like one corner of the world being opened up to the entirety of the world's commodity production and wealth. And the power of that is capable of breaking down all, well, Marx refers to it in the Communist Manifesto, breaking down all Chinese walls. And of course, with the Opium Wars, which admittedly came much later, that's precisely what the Brits did. Um, so I've mentioned, uh, actually, it must, uh, it must be also be mentioned that in this period of kind of the developing world market, we not only have the global enslavement of much of the world's population, really, but also in the 16th century, some of the kind of the, the institutions of British capitalism come into being. The London Stock Exchange is founded in 1571, under a feudal monarchy, obviously. Also, the first, ever, the, the first ever national bank in the world, the Bank of England, was founded on December 31st, 1600, by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth I. Again, not by a bourgeois republic or some kind of bourgeois constitutional monarchy, by the absolutist monarchy. And um, the significance of this shows, first of all, that the kind of merchant bourgeoisie are becoming increasingly powerful. It also shows the relationship between that class and the state, which is what I'm going to come on to a little bit later. But I mentioned earlier that labor was required. In a sense, a working class was retired, uh, required. People didn't necessarily think of it in those terms, but a working class was required. How do you create a working class? Again, when people today, and maybe you've encountered this in seminars, when people today raise the question of wage slavery and exploitation, <coughs> a, a, a response I've heard is that um, kind of this fictitious idea that really a bourgeois is someone a bit, with a bit more money who offers it to someone else and they go, yeah, all right, yeah, I'll work for you. But let's not forget that in the past, hundreds of years ago, people tended to work the land. And if they didn't work the land, they tended to work with their own means of production, in their own workshop, for example, in their own tools if they're a travelling craftsman. They had their own way of working and producing their own living. The idea of going and being completely dependent on someone else was completely alien. And actually, it wasn't a very good idea because of the instability of that existence. What you had to do is force people to do it. Now, I mentioned earlier the encroachment onto common land of the kind of the feudal aristocracy. This developed at a much more rapid pace partly because the discovery of all this gold um, alongside this rising commodity economy, it increased prices. And you, have an, you had an inflation crisis actually in Tudor, Tudor England at one point. Now one effect of that is it made the kind of production of commodities on the land much more um, profitable and much more uh, sought after. And so we have an, incre at an increasing rate, these enclosures of common lands and the turfing out of people who lived on those lands in order to turn them into sheep walks. We actually have a... Uh, a an eyewitness, Thomas More himself, who famously wrote the book Utopia, his, his Utopia, he himself says, Yea, and certain abbots, holy men no doubt, leave no ground for tillers. They enclose all into pastures. They throw down houses. They pluck down towns and leave nothing standing but the, only the church to be made a sheep house. In, in, in essence, there was a revolution going on in the countryside. The first revolution that gave birth to capitalism in England was not the English Civil War, which was a revolution. It wasn't the Industrial Revolution. That was really the fruit of all these changes. It was the ag agrarian revolution in the countryside. And sadly, it wasn't a revolution that took a kind of nice democratic form. The kind of revolutions that had freed the peasantry had already taken place. It was a revolution waged by landowners, a mixture of, I suppose, what you might call capitalist farmers at this time, speculators who'd come into good times and bought land off the, the waning feudal aristocracy, and feudal landlords themselves, forcibly making people homeless in order to turn their homes into wool-producing sheep walks. Well, what happened to these people? These people were literally left to wander, wander the countryside, like the Jews in the desert in the Bible. They were basically um, persona non grata, surplus to requirements. Actually, people at the time even talked about overpopulation, which, again, I find very interesting, considering the, the crisis of overpopulation that the bourgeois talk about today, when people like Emmanuel Macron talk about African mothers having too many babies. It's essentially the same problem. But what, what was happening? The, um, the, uh, the, the, the social problem that was created by this was so great that the state, the absolute state, actually had to step in. And one of the things it did was, first of all, um, Henry VIII actually forbade the destruction of houses of husbandry, so like farmsteads, 
over 20 acres. It tried to put a check on this development because think of the social chaos all this, a, a migratory population just wandering around the countryside was causing. The state had a bit of an issue with that, but the main way the state dealt with it is as follows. In 1530, an act was passed in which homeless vagabonds, that's basically these, these people, these families have been turfed off the land, they were to be whipped and uh, imprisoned if, well, that's in the case of sturdy vagabonds. Um, and on a second offence, they'd be whipped again and half their ear would be cut off. If they were caught a third time, they'd be killed and executed as a criminal. In 1545, uh, 1547, that was modified. If anyone refused to work, so if any vag vagabond is captured and told you have to go work X, he was to be condemned as a slave to the person who denounced him as an idler. If he missed work for more than two weeks, he is to be made a slave for life and branded with an S on the forehead. If he runs away three times, so in fairness, they do give him three chances, he's to be executed as a felon. He can be sold by his master, so he's a chattel slave at this point. His children are to be taken away and made into apprentices until the age of 24 for boys and 20 for girls. If they run away, they are to become slaves of their masters. These slaves, and actually these slaves still existed up until the 19th century. It was banned in the 19th century, but they still continued to live and they were known as roundsmen. So, this is, first of all, this is very interesting that at this same time, when manufacturing is starting to develop in the earliest forms, you could be considered uh, you know, able to work as early as the age of about nine or 10. And yet, you're not, you're not considered having completed your apprenticeship until the age of 24. It shows that the definition of what is and isn't a child is always determined really by the interests of the ruling class. Marx talks about that a lot in Capital, but I don't have time to go into that. Also, 7,200, actually, um, Hume, said that it was 72,000, but other sources have um, said that maybe that's too big. It is absolutely, absolutely enormous. But let's say at least 7,200 people were executed as thieves during the reign of Henry VII. I, I compared that to, uh, as a proportion of the population, I compared that to today. That would be more than the total prison population of England today being executed for, for the crime of thievery. So you can see what kind of social problem was, uh, was developing here. Similar laws were also passed in Holland and France, so this isn't a unique development. Another development that I want to talk about is the Reformation. Now, the Reformation is, is pretty, in, in the way it took place at least, is pretty unique to England. So this isn't the determining force that created capitalism. But again, similar to things like the Black Death, similar to the accidental discovery of the Americas, it's another huge shot in the arm for the English bourgeoisie. The reason for that is because the church was one of the most powerful wings of the feudal ruling class. It was one of the biggest <coughs> landowners in the world, probably, certainly in Europe. It, um, it, and so the exp uh, expropriation of those lands by the state, and then those lands being sold on at knockdown prices to speculators, to merchant farmers, and to kind of royal favourites and other feudal aristocrats, basically created the kind of agrarian capitalism which characterised England, or helped uh, spur on the development of that capitalism, which characterised England in this era. It's kind of, it, again, it reminds me of neoliberal governments selling off things like the post office at a knockdown price to speculators to make as much money as possible. Um, and th with this widespread poor prison, in other words, you have more and more property, property sorry, being concentrated and alienated and alienable. In other words, land is no longer tied by personal relationships between vassals. It's sold on a market. That, that land is then let out for money rents to people. And of course, the person you want to let your land to is the person who's going to pay the best rent. In this um, context, people like John Locke start talking about improvement. If you've read the theories of John Locke, you can see the influence of the discovery of the Americas and of developing capitalist agriculture on his ideas. He talks about his labor theory of value is that everything I mix my labor with is mine by right. And, but it only counts as labor if I've improved it. And what he meant by improvement was basically making it more profitable, making it more pr uh, productive. We can see the logic of capitalism behind this. He also said, interestingly, not just labor that he did, but labor that his servants, in quotation marks, did, counts as his labor. This is basically a, an early expression of capitalist, the capitalist attitude towards agriculture. Um, and in answer to pauperism, one um, very early pioneer, I guess, you'd have to call him, of the bourgeoisie in the court of King James I, put forward the idea Elizabeth I introduced the poor rate, in other words, kind of trying to mollify, trying to sit, change the situation by giving out um, charity effectively. Well, this, uh, this pioneering, enterprising bourgeois in, uh, I assume he was a bourgeois, in James's um, court, in the parliament, sorry, suggested they create what he called prisons, where the parish could force people who refused to work to work there and receive food. 
Those, have, those would eventually become workhouses in the Victorian era. It was basically preceding the development of the workhouse. And the purpose of the workhouse was not so much to force people to work, it was to force people into being proletarians. One thing that we have to understand is simply kicking people off their land does not immediately make them prepared to work in, in the early days, seven days a week for about 12 hours a day, even 14 hours a day for someone else. That has to be hammered into them. And Marx actually makes the point that under capitalism in his day, and certainly in our day, capitalist exploitation presents itself to the worker like a natural law. So often, and I've seen Marxist historians talk about this, and there is an element of truth in it. They say capitalism is based solely on economic coercion. In other words, fear of starvation makes the worker work. He doesn't have to be forced into work. Whereas all previous forms of society were based on non-economic coercion. But what we have to understand with the development of capitalism, that economic, solely economic coercion comes about only after centuries of literally forcing and enslaving people to uh, teach them, to hammer them into the shape of proletarians. This took the form of stealing, ch stealing their children to make them apprentices until the age of 20 years old, where they can be confined into the early manufacturers. Incidentally, the first manufacturer was um, founded in Norwich in the 16th century later factories founded in the 18th century. These people were thrown into the factories in order to raise a generation of workers. This, this class had to be created, uh, forged if you like, in the fires of exploitation. And um, I've, I've already gone on longer than I wanted, but there are a couple of important points that I wanted to raise before I finish. This actually raises a very interesting question about the nature of the state. I've talked a lot about absolutism. When people talk about the bourgeois state, they don't tend to think of an absolutist feudal mo monarchy. Um, and it's not the ideal form of a bourgeois state. The, the ideal bourgeois state is some form of constitutional, um, either republic or monarchy, but a, a bourgeois liberal democracy. It allows for basically the most efficient form of bourgeois rule. So what was the role of absolutism? And it, to understand this, we need to go back to the classics, really. Engels describes, he explains, that the origin of the state comes from the splitting up of society into classes, these classes with conflicting economic interests, so they don't consume themselves and society into fruitless struggle. It becomes necessary to have a power seemingly standing above society that would alleviate the conflict and keep it within the bounds of order. <coughs> and this power risen out of society but placing itself above it and alienating itself more and more from it is the state. Marx on Bonapartism in his 18th Brumaire explains that in certain periods where the class struggle is at a high, its highest pitch, the state can actually gain an element of autonomy and actually raise itself above the class struggle in order to impose order seemingly from without. I'd say we see this under absolutism. That's not to say that absolutism is Bonapartism. They're different phenomena. But what we do see in the period that I've just um, described is a period in which you have a powerful but waning feudal class, a large um, but diffuse peasantry with its, with its own class interests, although the extent to which the peasantry is a class is another question. And of course the bourgeoisie starting to assert their interests. That is a very chaotic cocktail of class interests. And what we see in the ab absolutist monarchy is a, a section of the ruling class basically lifting itself up and sometimes leaning on the bourgeois to strike blows against its feudal rivals, sometimes leaning on the feudal aristocracy to strike blows against the bourgeoisie, less often in England's case, and sometimes leaning on the peasantry to strike blows against both. For example, I mentioned that the, the absolutist monarchy actually limited, it limited the number of looms you could have in a workshop, it limited the number of farms that could <coughs> be destroyed, ultimately it was powerless against this developing economic tide. But the overall effects of absolutism, this kind of uh, you know, mutual um, subjugation of all classes to the, uh, the, the state, actually gave the bourgeois, the developing bourgeoisie, the protection it needed in order to develop. It did this abroad as well as at home. So at home, it gave them a certain amount of protection. Abroad, the f developing policy of protection and of securing markets by force, either by shooting down, for example, you know, Dutch ships, competitors, or going into uh, previously uncolonized territories and forcing them under the, uh, the English flag. This was a great way of securing markets for and as well as uh, resources for developing manufacture. In this period, you really see kind of, it's almost like a baby in the womb being fed. <laughs> And the, the, the absolute state is almost like the mother feeding it through all this uh, relentless kind of exploitation and slavery and colonialism so that this baby can finally emerge from the womb. And that's where the kind of political and social bourgeois revolutions came from. We're dialecticians. We don't believe that one form of state is permanently sufficient for any form of class rule. The absolutist monarchy was absolutely necessary, I would say, for the development of the bourgeoisie um, in England, for example, and other places, in, even France, especially France in some ways. But it eventually turns into a fetter, it becomes a block actually. And the kind of, the absolutist um, monarchy and its own interests start constantly knocking against the developing bourgeoisie. At a certain point when the bourgeois are strong enough, 
they are able to overthrow it. But they do so using the, uh, the power of the rest of the so-called nation. For example, the power of the peasantry in the case of the French Revolution. There would have been no successful French Revolution without the intervention of the peasants. And the bourgeois standing, again, as Marx says, taking advantage of the you know, victories of other classes, you might say, they put themselves at the head of the nation in order to secure their own benefit. Does that mean, just because, I, from, based on what I'm saying, that means that development predates the bourgeois revolutions of, in England, France, so on. Does that mean the bourgeois revolutions are almost like an extravagance, that they weren't necessary, and that all was necessary was the absolutist monarchy to reform itself out of existence? Far from it. I'd recommend people go to the talk we're going to have on the English Revolution to find out more. I've already gone over time, so I can't go into detail. But what I'll say is after, after this revolution takes place, even though monarchy was restored in England, and the revolution that the bourgeois celebrate is called the Glorious Revolution in 1688, which was actually just a coup, replacing one monarch with a, a Dutch adventurer by the name of William of Orange. What happens after is enclosure acts. Enclosures and encroachments on put the common land had actually been illegal previously. They were just happening without the state really doing all that much. Enclosure acts start being passed by Parliament. The clearing of entire populations, like in the Scottish clearings later on, becomes an act of the state itself. The lands expropriated from the royalists, again, like the church lands, were sold off at a knockdown rate. It was like giving an immense injection. Finally, the bourgeois find themselves in the saddle. Even if they're not in the palace, it doesn't really matter. In Parliament and in the country, they have control of the state. And having taken control of the state, first they modify the form of the state. The English state is not the same in 1688 as it is in 1911, for example. There's a number of modifications, um, for example, extending the franchise and so on. They modify the state to their own interests and they use it as a weapon to, yes, conquer the world, but also conquer British society for their own exploitation. There's much, much more that could be said about that. One thing I'd mention, one other thing I'd mention about the role of the state is, I mentioned all these enclosures. Let's see if I can find the statistic without uh, running over too long. I bet I can't now. Uh, yeah, okay, between 1801 and 1831, so obviously the bourgeoisie are fully in control at this point, 3.5 million acres of common land were enclosed by Parliament. That's the latter stage of enclosure. The golden age of enclosure was in the 18th century, I'm afraid I can't tell you how much. Think of all the people who were expropriated, kicked off their own land and reduced to homelessness. This is the age of prosperity, by the way, of course. Um, now, at a similar time, in 1853, no, in 1833, the British government abolished slavery, which is nice, and decided to make up for its crimes, it would compensate the slave owners by a princely sum of £20 million. Pounds. It paid 3,000 3, 3, families £20 million, pounds, which in today's money is £16.5 and it constituted 40% of the treasury at that time. Um, they didn't think to compensate the peasants that they'd just thrown off the land. We can see the, the role of class and class struggle in the state here, that in reality it was a, a struggle of the slave owners against the people of the world. That was the British state at that time. And so what does that, and to conclude, because I'm, I'm, well, Dan would be kicking me under the chair if I was too close enough to him. What does this tell us, A, about capitalism, but also about B, how to overthrow it? First of all, we see in the development of capitalism that first, it, it comes, yes, from a struggle against the kind of the, the natural economy and the, the bondage of feudalism. It, is, it does come from a struggle for liberation, but it was out of really kind of the, the bitter fruits of that struggle for libera liberation was itself the enslavement of the world on an even higher level, on an even greater scale than ever before. That the freedom of capital is necessarily the slavery, whether that be the wage slavery or the, uh, the, the chattel slavery of the masses of the earth. But that shows us a pattern actually this constant clash between, if you like, capital and labour, of freedom for capital, freedom for labour, gives us the opportunity to abolish and annihilate slavery the world over for good. Unfortunately, the peasants that fought in the Peasants' Revolt, due to the period they were in, the development of the productive forces, they could not have created the kind of peasant communism that some of them dreamt for. Unfortunately, the levellers in the English Civil War, unfortunately, were not able to do it. We can do it because of the productive forces unleashed by this development of capitalism. That's the only way, that's the only sense in which what Theresa May said is remotely correct. That the only progressive aspects of capitalism is the concentration of the means of production, which formerly had been scattered throughout the countryside and the villages, could not be used to produce wealth for the whole of humanity on a necessary scale. They've been concentrated in the hands of a few billionaires, effectively, a few monopolies. And, and I want to finish on a quote from Marx. I always like to finish on Marx because he's, uh, he's pretty good. And um, 
And he says he tends to say things better than me. So again, from Capital Volume 1, the transformation of scattered private property arising from individual labour into capitalist private property is naturally a process incomparably more protracted, violent and difficult than the transformation of capitalistic private property already practically resting on socialised production into socialised property. In the former case, we had the expropriation of the mass of the people by a few usurpers. In the latter, we had the expropri expropriation of a few usurpers by the mass of the people. That is our cause. That is our fight. Let's finish it. Thank you.